So the last pieces of the structural element puzzle are slabs and foundations. These are where the load path in a building starts, uh, in slabs where we're gathering uh, floor loads, and where, uh, where it ends, in foundations where we're distributing those floor loads and the loads of everything else in the building uh, out into the ground, into the earth. Um, why do we put them together? Well, the principles are equal and opposite. In one case, we're gathering loads, concentrating them into columns, and in the other, we're typically taking loads from those columns uh, and spreading them out over a uh, stratum of soil that can, that can handle it. Um, there are similar mechanical principles at work, and there are also similar problems. In particular, uh, something called punching shear, uh, which as you can imagine, anywhere where we're taking a very, very heavy uh, slab or floor, and we're putting it on top of, or in the case foundations, underneath, a kind of needle thin column, we're worried about the column punching through one or the other. And we'll talk about strategies for dealing with that and how they're actually similar in both floor slabs and in foundations. So just where we are, we're at the end of this kind of four piece uh, discussion of structural elements. We started uh, by talking about uh, equilibrium and how each of the elements we're gonna talk about has to stay in translational and rotational equilibrium. We spent a lot of time talking about that with beams, where those uh, problems are, uh, are, are most uh, both accessible and also uh, most critical. We then went and actually went through beam design, so shear moment diagram within the element itself, uh, and how we use section modulus to deal with that. We looked at column design, how we take loads and put them into usually, but not always, vertical elements. Uh, and how columns are actually secretly like beams. A lot of times they're subjected to buckling in addition to compression. And we went through a design process where we used uh, slenderness ratios and safe allowable loads over unbraced lengths to figure out how uh, to design those elements. For slabs and foundations, we'll talk about a couple of principles, uh, one-way slabs versus two-way slabs. Uh, we'll talk about shear transfer. And then we'll switch to foundations and we'll talk about soil mechanics and foundation types. When we're designing slabs, typically we're using tables to size them, so similar to columns, no real math involved. And when we're sizing foundations, uh, we will do some very basic calculations to look at how we can uh, safely spread loads out over soils of a, of a given density or a given type. So this is where we are. We're in our last piece. We've got four videos. Uh, to get through uh, slabs and foundations, and then we'll be done with 347 uh, structural elements. In uh, the next phase, we'll talk about how those elements go together in uh, what we call frames, right? Uh, collections of beams, girders, columns, and slabs. Uh, we'll look at the synergy between them, and we'll look at how we connect them in order to make sure that that, uh, that, that synergy takes place. So in this video in particular, uh, we will look at the difference between one-way slabs and two-way slabs, why we use one or the other, uh, and why two-way slabs in particular give us greater efficiency uh, and what we do to kind of um, ramp up that efficiency or to hack uh, slab principles uh, to take advantage of that. So we have uh, looked a little bit at tributary area uh, at how we calculate loads in particular on columns, taking uh, bay sizes, uh, multiplying them to get the area of a typical bay, giving ourselves an assigned uh, combined live and dead load, usually from the code or from standards for that, and then just sort of assuming that all of that kind of spills nicely uh, into columns uh, floor by floor. The question is, how do we get those loads into the columns in the first place? And in particular, how do we keep the slab from punching through? Um, thinking about the, the column being needle thin, uh, how do we stop the, the, the needle from just sort of slicing through the, the, the column because of sh or the slab because of shear? We've talked about how the columns operate, how we design those both against compression and buckling. That part's pretty easy. We have a similar set of issues down at the base. We're collecting on the floors and we're distributing in the foundations. And we'll look at the mechanics uh, of distributing both of those here. The issue we have is that all we have to work with so far is uh, beam theory. And we could certainly attack the problem using bending, right? Thinking about kind of bending in two directions 
and uh, the beam as an area instead of as, as, a, as a line, right? So a plane instead of a line. The problem is that if we use simple bending theory for very, very wide, very, very shallow beams, we know that that's a pretty dumb way to make a beam. We're adding a lot of weight by making it wide, uh, and we're not gaining a lot of uh, structural uh, effectiveness because we're not making it any deeper. So as a real quick thought experiment, if we take, say, a 32-foot square bay, and we assume that we want to build it out of a 4-inch deep concrete slab, which is a pretty standard flat slab dimension, um, we can go through and we can calculate this exactly as we would uh, a beam. We can use WL over 8. Uh, we can take the total dead load. We know the weight uh, of, the, of the concrete, um, 0.830 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, or, sorry, 0 0.0830 pounds per uh, cubic inch, um, we end up with uh, about uh, 589,000 pounds for a, a 32 foot square bay. And if we take that as our load and do our WL over eight calculation, and then using the maximum moments, almost 2,400 kip pounds, if we back out a section modulus from that, we get a, a pretty big required section modulus, right? A, a concrete is heavy and we have quite a bit of it if we're uh, doing a 32 by 32 foot slab. So we need to find a section modulus that in this case, when we do M equals FS, uh, we find that our required section modulus is 3,775 inches cubed, right? Pretty serious. If we then plug that back in using our formula for the section modulus of a rectangle, what we end up with is finding that the section modulus necessary to carry a four inch slab is actually almost seven and three quarters uh, inches, right? That, the, that the, the beam actually needs to be deeper than the, the, the slab we wanna carry. So if we go back and iterate this, what we find is that we're chasing our tail, that concrete is so heavy and our bay size is so big or if you want to think about it, our beam is so wide, right, and so kind of dumbly designed um, that we can never get a beam deep enough to carry its own weight over this 32-foot span, right? Now, that's just according to beam theory, and that jibes with what we've talked about before, that when we're designing beams, we want to add depth. We don't want to add width. We want to carve out as much material from the neutral axis as we can. So here's a case where we've drawn what we know is a slab, 32 by 32, four inches deep. The problem is that that's such a terrible beam shape that over the span that we want to go, we can't actually carry our own dead weight, right? This is a, a, a non-starter if we think about it just as a, as, a, as a beam. And the issue really is that what we've done there is we have designed what we call a one-way slab, a slab where all of the load paths are going in a single linear direction. Um, and we uh, do this typically when we're designing very long, skinny uh, floor plates. So here you can see a one-way slab where each one of those planks is behaving basically independently, and they're all kind of shaped pretty poorly. And you can imagine that here we want to limit the length as much as we can. So we can use simple beam theory to design slabs if they have a proportion uh, that is greater than 1 to 1.5, right? So essentially, if they are long, skinny rectangles, we have a chance of getting beam theory to work, right? But usually this span is going to be fairly uh, limited. If we do a little thought experiment, right, uh, we've taken what we call unbonded one-way slabs, so where every piece of it is disconnected from its neighbor. And if you think about um, maybe wood flooring that you've seen or maybe precast decks that you've seen, they're very often keyed to one another, right? There's a little ridge and a little slot so that when you push on one plank or on one board, it pulls the other boards down with it. This is what we call a bonded one-way slab. And what happens here is that when we put a load on one piece of it, um, yes, we can think of this as a, as a long skinny beam uh, but we can, or uh, sorry, a, a very uh, broad, deep beam. But we can also think of it as a series of planks in which when we try to deflect one, that beam is pulling all of the other beams down with it. And we can rely on the resistance to deflection in each one of those planks to sort of build up over time. 
This starts to get us toward what we call two-way action. This is still going in one direction. We only have supports on one side uh, and the other. Um, but you can imagine that we're starting to rely on more than just the section modulus of that one plank to act as a beam. We're starting to resist deflection among all of those planks. And some of the load of P is actually being shared, not just in one direction, but it's starting to be shared in two directions, right? It's starting to get borne by uh, each one of those planks in sequence. Okay, now let's think about what happened if we take all of those bonded planks and we support them not just on the two sides, but on all four edges. Now what we find is that when we put a load on one of those planks, it's not only dragging the other planks down with it, but it has to twist every plank in the bay because this plank is going to deflect, but the plank at the very edge can't deflect. It's supported by a beam. And all of a sudden what we find is that the load P is now shared not only in a linear direction, as if it were on one long flat beam, but it's actually shared in two directions, right? There are two kind of thought experiment beams here, one of which is supporting the beam left to right, the other of which is supporting the beam front to back. When we do the calculation in a pure two-way slab, where all of the planks are bonded or where the slab is completely monolithic, what we find is that the load ends up being shared in quarters instead of in halves. And we have this two-way action that starts to distribute the load eventually throughout the entire slab, right? monolithic behavior. We have no way to easily calculate that. Right? We can't use our simple beam equilibrium uh, formulas to figure out how that works. We actually have to use some statistics to figure out the probability of the load going to various uh, parts of the, of, the, of the bay. What ends up happening is if we fully support the slab all along the edges, one quarter of that load gets equally distributed to every side. And in fact, instead of just two directions, we find that that load is shared in an infinite number of directions, right? Monolithic behavior or what we call hyperstatic behavior, right? Many, many, many uh, load paths, redundant load paths, which we know are hard to calculate. We also know those are more efficient. And this is the reason that we can use relatively thin slabs to span relatively big distances if we support them in more than one direction, right? If we make them work like uh, monolithic beams that have to behave in multiple directions. Those multiple load paths reinforce each other, they distribute the load uh, more efficiently, and we end up with something that is more efficient than a, than a simple beam. So we can think about this too like a network of beams or a grid of beams. And if you think about this, if you push down on one node in a two-way uh, beam system, you are going to deflect every single node in that system, right? Maybe not very much, right? The, the nodes over here, uh, far away from the load, are going to deflect a very, very small amount. But you're basically, uh, structural engineers call this recruiting, right? You're, you're requiring all of those elements to deflect, and therefore you're, uh, you're making use of the resistance to deflection the capability of a material to take stress in every single one uh, of those connected beams. If we're designing something that is more of a square bay, less than 1 to 1.5, we find that this two-way action is much, much more efficient because it distributes the loads uh, and the internal stresses to all four sides, right? Not just the two supports that we're used to when we're talking about beams. And we can also take advantage of uh, the fact that if we do have a beam and slab system, if we connect them together, bonding the beams to the slab, then we're uh, basically making a mesh, a grid, a network uh, of beams below. And once we load one corner of the slab, all of those beams are going to have to deflect to carry the load, to distribute it uh, to the supports we uh, essentially end up with a, a, a lower effective span, uh, in this case because the beams are actually uh, helping to resist deflection in, in more than one direction. And that means that for the same load, the beams are going to experience, basically it's going to feel like a shorter span, just like the effective length principle in columns, and therefore it's going to feel like 
less maximum moment for each one of them. We also have a situation here when we're going over multiple columns, right, or multiple supports. Um, we're taking advantage of, the again, the hyperstatic or the monolithic uh, nature that we can have where we're connecting girders and columns in ways that don't allow for rotation. Difficult to calculate. We can't use our equilibrium equations then, but we can imagine again that every single one of those joints is going to have to do some work uh, once we load the slab, and therefore it's going to be distributed uh, more efficiently, more effectively throughout the entire structure. Always in slab design, we're looking though to, uh, to take advantage of that two-way behavior, but also to think about ways to remove the dead weight of the concrete. Um, even though we, we're getting around this kind of limitation of, of self-weight when we have a two-way uh, slab, we still want to eliminate as much weight as we can. And so very often, we'll use these principles where we are designing thin slabs but we are adding uh, elements to them that give the system uh, a greater amount of depth. So here we, uh, we'll, we'll talk about folded plates uh, in 445, but here you can imagine that we're going from uh, a thin slab that, that can't carry itself uh, to a, a thicker slab that is rigid, but maybe is adding more dead weight than the slab itself can carry. What we're doing here is we are keeping the depth of the slab but we are trying to remove as much dead weight as possible. And, and effectively, we're creating a, a whole sequence of interlocked beams that instead of an I-beam profile have, in this case, a kind of U-shaped profile or a W-shaped profile. Has the section modulus, maybe not quite as much section modulus as uh, our, our uh, solid slab, um, but for that small penalty in section modulus, we're also eliminating an awful lot of dead weight, right? Sort of tricking the slab into thinking that it's much deeper uh, than, than, it, than it really is, or much thicker than it really is. Um, one of the reasons that we want to eliminate weight wherever we can is this problem of punching shear. That especially when we're talking about concrete, which is one of our favorite materials for, for floor slabs for good reasons. It's strong, but it's also uh, fire resistant acoustically uh, deadening. Um, the, the problem with concrete is that it's really heavy. And so when we are trying to put a very heavy floor on top of a relatively narrow column, we get this phenomenon called punching shear, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's like uh, trying to, to push a, a needle through a, a cake, right? If we don't have enough shear resistance, the needle or the column is just going to go right through. Um, here is an example uh, of punching shear. Hopefully this is something you never run across on a job site, here is a, a more benign example of it where you can see these stress cracks developing uh, and, and it's just the reinforcing in that slab that's keeping the, the column from punching through. We can address this in a couple of ways. We can make the columns wider, we can make the slabs deeper. Um, both of those uh, provide more cross-sectional area. What we're after really is those dashed lines where the plan of the column and the section of the uh, the, the slab give us a kind of usually a cylindrical or a square perimeter uh, that we can rely on the, the, the shear resistance per square inch to resist. We want to find tricks though where we can um, kind of make only the top of the column wider, right, or only the area around the column deeper uh, for the slab so that we're taking advantage of that bigger interface, that larger cylinder or uh, or a cube where the, the, the plan of the column and the section of the slab intersect without adding dead weight, which is always the kind of uh, biggest problem uh, in slab design. Okay, so having established what's one way versus what's two way, in the next video, we'll look at different types of slabs in a couple of different materials. Uh, and we'll also look at ways that we uh, get that kind of behavior out of our slabs, right? How we go from simple spanning beams, uh, making those beams work in concert or making them into monolithic structures that can give us that two-way uh, uh, behavior that gives us the added efficiency uh, of slabs over beams.